Thank you. Um, I must first and foremost register my thanks to organizers for, for the opportunity and for inviting me here. Um, yes, you asked for um, a business perspective, but clearly I'm not the right representative for business. I will share with you elements of how we can make the economy, the business part of the economy, work for the poor. And I firmly believe that um, um, the two propositions that um, Axel and yourself at the beginning um, observed are absolutely critical, um, except that with respect to a structural reform, a structural adjustment, uh, we need to be absolutely clear that it means different things to different people. To economists of uh, macroeconomic orientation, a structural adjustment has a specific connotation that is almost uh, insult to many political and social activists because it associates it with the World Bank IMF and the type of balance of payments and, and budgetary structural adjustment that, uh, if I'm not uh, mistaken, and as a man trying to be intuitive, all of you in this room will dislike. Um, and uh, so that's a structure, that a structural adjustment um, I presume is not what we are talking about. We are talking about a different type of adjustment. The second point, which is much closer to, to my personal interest over the years as a student of this field, is that we are talking not about making the economy work for the poor or for the rich or for this and for that. We are talking about the society being so restructured as the contestation between the poor and the rich, the young and the old and the child and the, and the elderly is minimized, not eliminated. Um, in my humble view, uh, at the moment as a student of economics uh, with interest in business as well as with keen interest on issues of social uh, uh, development, that is where I am and I'd like to share some views with you. To begin with, given the time constraints, uh, let's also register that in our quest for doing better, achieving more, we do not underestimate South Africa's achievements since 1994. As they say proverbially, the glass is half full and half empty. It is true that we always look at the half empty one, but we must not underestimate that by global standard, and I stand here in front of a specialist from Brazil, even by Brazilian, Mexican, Chilean, Latin American achievements over the past 50 years of experimentation, South Africa is not far behind in terms of uh, the enormity of what it has achieved. And by that I mean with the changes that Stephen <coughs> eloquently uh, articulated with the change of power and most importantly with the change of the constitution, um, I would say um, South Africa in long term still is ahead of many of its peers. To experiment with constitutional democracy and within that try to redress the past is not a small challenge that as a nation we have taken on. So the, the glass is half full and half empty. I'm going to obviously as a as a committed activist in, in this field, focus on the empty part because we want to achieve more. Uh, but I do not mean to underestimate what we have achieved. How do we make this society uh, work for, for the poor particularly, and should it be? Uh, my answer uh, definitely is yes, because if we do not take care of the poor, business sustainability, investment sustainability is near impossible. It's a matter of time before it grinds to a halt. So let's not then polarize or create false dichotomy between the interest of business and the interest of the poor. As a society, this is an absolutely ideological tyranny of the past that we dichotomize as if over the long term there is a, there is a tension or inherent tension between the poor and the rich. I think the debate has moved and these days businesses by and large are quite convinced that unless and until the broader social framework deals with the issues of poverty, the embedded risk is a risk to their business, to the prosperity of their business. So that's my first point. The second point is if you want to make a society, we got to, uh, in my humble view, and based on, I guess, the literature that, that I'm familiar with, um, to pay attention to first things first. And the most important first condition is that we got to, as a society, engage, and we have not yet done so in South Africa, um, 
to look at a set of consistent or congruent value systems. Um, to me, the missing piece in our political discourse, in our intellectual discourse at the moment, and certainly in business and social discourse is that we do not have a common set of values that we all as South Africans subscribe to, subscribe to in business, in government, or um, any other, including um, academics, labor unions, media, etc., etc. To believe that we can have um, a duality of values that if somebody is in business will act differently in other areas uh, is actually intellectually for me is very, very, compli uh, very naive. Uh, and let me give you a couple of examples. The biggest structural issue that we have in South Africa against the poor is the extractive conduct of all in power, whether they are in political power, in a state power, in business power, or in any other power. So for me as an economist, power is not just political power, business power. All those who are in power in South Africa at the moment are engaged in a non-stop, endless extraction of resources in and for themselves. They do it under different pretexts, and let me give you a few examples. Corruption in the state, to entrepreneurship, is every day, and now ANC is worried about, because it's gone too far. Uh, they started it, but they can't stop it. It's like genie out of the bottle. But we all take uh, time, and it's a uh, bright time discussion about corruption by the politicians and by the state executives, but corruption in the business executives is as damning. Corruption in the union system is as problematic. So it is not to believe that there is a clean society that only when you become a public service or you become an ANC operative, you become corrupt, is naive. If there is corruption, rest assured that the doctors will also charge you for overtime, right? Also, the construction companies will collude. Also, the dentists and lawyers and, and so on and so forth. I haven't got to go down. But the point I'm making is, as a society, we have underestimated the corrosive and the fundamental impact that corruption right across the organs of society, as much in business as in government, has on the poor. And how much of a tax it is on the poor. And how much it more than compensates the redistributive efforts of the state in favor of the poor. Our leaders in business and in government take pride how much welfare we pay and how much child grant and how much this grant and that grant we do, but in the same breath, they must acknowledge that their own conducts, whether they are political leaders, business leaders, labor union leaders, etc., etc., it more than wipes out whatever we have contributed to the poor. The biggest short-term obstacle, and I would say structural in the sense that it cuts deep into the moral value system of the society, is the fact that we are not examining our moral and ethical foundation. Bear in mind that back in the 18th century, economics grew out of moral philosophy. Economics without moral foundations is not sustainable, no matter how much you want to be clever in operative sense to change interest rates, to change deficit ratios, to change this, to, to increase welfare. If we do not get the underpinning moral um, foundations of our society, economics will grind to a halt, no matter whether you're a new liberal, communist, socialist, grassroots, et cetera, et cetera. The second point. <coughs> the second point I'd like to share, and these are my disjointed points because of the nature of time that I've got. Um, the second point is that in a modern economy, if we do not pay attention to the medium to long-term drivers of upward mobility, we are fooling ourselves to think that we are making progress for the poor. No government is big enough, no economy is rich enough to take care of the poor. The poor over the long term got to take care of themselves but our short-term responsibility it is to reconfigure the structures of power and the structures of economic activity to allow them 
and not to allow them to make it part and parcel of our social structure, social culture, if you like, so that upward mobility is integral to the workings of the society. In that context, our biggest failure against the poor has been, remains, is the desperate state of our education. This is not a small issue from an economic point of view, from a business point of view. Business sustainability, sustainability of investment by local or foreign. For me, there is no distinction whatsoever. Unless we're sure that this economy will be able to create a skilled people who know what they do, whatever it is, whether they run an NGO, whether they run an education system, whether they run a bank insurance, they got to know what they're doing. Not only in, in, in absolute terms, but in relative terms, better than what other nations who are competing with us do. So that to me is the most damning structural fault lines in our system, and we're paying, quite frankly, lip service to it. We're paying lip service because we keep um, talking around the issues. We haven't even started talking about the curriculum. We're talking about whether we deliver textbooks or not, whether the schools have got a roof on them or not, whether the teachers are qualified or not. We've got another 20 years to go before we set the poor structurally on an upward mobility trajectory. Now, I don't have time to give you uh, numbers, and you can d in these days Google them to see how skill intensive the, the economy has become. No matter how much we push and pull, no matter who is in power or out of power, there is no way that the economy can become less skill intensive. So let's not faff around and, and, and damage and, and harm the poor more. We got to find ways of literally as a national priority to put them on upward mo mobility, our own society. It's not about business or the poor, the left or the right. This is about social uh, progress and development. The next point, next to education, which is common between business investor concern as well as uh, those who had anticipations of uh, or expectations of, of social development which they are disappointed is the fact that the state inefficiency on the back of a number of political expediencies such as K the deployment, uh, uh, employment equity and so on. All of them are fully understandable for social transformation. Nonetheless, the sum total of all those expedient short-term intervention is that the state, as we gather today here, is inefficient at the expense of the poor. Remember in every society, leftist, rightist, any other, you cannot succeed in developmental objectives unless and until you have a state that is capable that is focused, that is committed to, not short-term, but long-term achievement of social goals. I'm aware that National Development Plan talks about this issue, but I believe it terribly underestimates it. For me, NDP is not a plan, it's a vision. We must be very careful not to equate the two. Otherwise, we'll be sitting here five years later. I may not be here, but those who are here, they'll be disappointed that where things went wrong again. <laughs> Why did we miss it again? Well, we again, because we talk about NDP as if it's a plan. If you ask the president, the cabinet, or the authors of NDP, what is this year's uh, role of government in this plan? There is no timeline. There is no resources. <laughs> there is no set of interventions. And plan, by definition, for those of us who've been in this game for 30, 40 years, know that plan without timeline, without allocation of responsibilities and so on and so forth, is like saying that I want to build a house of so many bedrooms and so many facilities. When is it going to start? Who is in charge? Who is in charge of what part? Oh, well, we'll think about it. We'll get into Not a me. discourse. Um, and uh, I know discourse is good for some, but it does not alleviate poverty. Um, so the, the efficiency and, or the inefficiency of a state in South Africa, bearing in mind that roughly about 45% of our national income is channeled through the public, state, public sector. Call it for the sake of our discussion, half of our national income is channeled through the state. Now how do you think an economy can continue? How do you think 
investment can continue, business can be globally competitive. If half of our GDP is used the way that we read it in the papers every day. Do I make sense? Put it differently technically. How much should the other half improve its productivity, its impact, its global competitiveness to compensate for the other half that is totally useless and inefficient and be globally competitive? Is it then surprising that our export is suffering? Is it then surprising that our businesses cannot compete globally? Is it then uh, surprising that we are uh, declining in terms of our attractiveness for investors, full stop, foreign or local? I appeal to you, do not get into this discussion that there is a crowd from Mars called foreign di direct investors who are very different from good old uh, South African investors. They are the same and exactly identical breed. Their criteria are the same. As my time is drawing to a close, let me add to, to, to two more points. I've made the point that unless and until we take very seriously about the type of changes, both at institutional level, cultural level, and political level, that the most important intervention that we can make in favor of the poor is to make the machinery of the state to be an efficient and effective machinery. In any society, it's the poor who is at the mercy of the, the, the state. It is true in Europe. It's true of any other country of your choice. The rich always, by definition, have options. It is the poor who, as we know in the economic literature, have limitations and in inordinate dependency on the machinery of the state. So that's the next point, that if we want to talk about uh, reconfiguring, structurally adjusting our system to work for the poor, and this is common between business and government. The final point that I'd like to, to raise here, it's got to do with the structure of our economy. The structure of our economy at the moment has become and will continue to become more system and skill intensive. It is true as much in agriculture as it's in mining, as it's banking. The days of low skill or no skill intensity of the economy is gone. Gone irreversibly. Um, so <coughs> let's not pretend that if we introduce wage subsidy or if we introduce some or other pact, business will become now so labor intensive that would say, well, forget about computers and laptop. Let's bring the typewriters and let's have a floor which is called the typing pool. Some of you are young to remember that businesses had a floor called typing pool. It was incredibly labor intensive. No matter what labor flexibility, no matter what type of waging you introduce, Gone are the days that we will do away with our computers, with our laptops, with our cell phones, and have a pool of labor-intensive typing army, right? I'm using this example. You can exactly copy it to banking. You can exactly copy it, copy it to insurance, to mining, to agriculture, to any form of activity, except for the moment in the public sector. That's why the municipalities are so rotten, because they want to fill up Floors with typing pool. Are you surprised that the poor are getting nothing? Are you surprised that government is actually going round, not government, but let me clarify, the state is going round and round, not achieving much? And when they really want to achieve something, they appoint consultants. <laughs> so in other words, add to the floor, but they outsource it, not on the premises, off the premises. So these are the issues of poverty. These are the, the, the issues of both, to wrap it up. Uh, how many minutes have I got? Off my time. A minute, fine. I'll, I'll have a business minute, which is exactly 60 seconds. So, um, <laughs> which essentially to wrap it up, we got to do two things for ourselves, not just for the poor. I do not for a moment separate the poor and the rich and let's not mutilate the society as if we can have 
mutilated society and have progress. If we restructure power, we should look at the systemic, organic relationships that exist between and among different organs of the society. In, to that end, the most important challenge that we have, and I believe intellectuals and NGOs are particularly well placed to challenge and to lead that, and that is to, to begin a discourse on a set of values that should permeate the society. Then, for me, the first and the necessary condition is in place. If we do that, it will take two generations to internalize it. Let's not get disappointed that, yeah, we, we listed all the uh, values that we should have, integrity, et cetera, et cetera, uh, and why is it not happening? Well, it takes two generations to embed them. It's like things don't move overnight. Otherwise, Botafila would have done the trick. Do you know what that's about? Yeah. So let's learn from ourselves and from others. The next point, whereas that will take two generations to embed, there are immediate things that we can do that within two to five years we will see dramatic change in the welfare of the poor. First, we've got to get the efficiency of the state. No matter what, no matter how difficult the political choice is, that is an inevitable one. If not, that's not done, we are wasting time and resources. We are building expectations that can only fail. And the last point is, although education and the skill is a long to medium to long term, like, unless we start it, we'll never start. So let's not postpone that because of expediency of election, expediency of this dominant group or that dominant group. We've got to pull all the steps to deal with these issues. And last and not least, let's not think that the business doesn't care about these issues. Business is as worried about these issues as NGOs. Business is as worried about the risk to its sustainability, global competitiveness, as politicians who pretend they care about these issues. Thank you very much, Iraj.